Well, good morning. Can you believe we're already on week number five of You'll Get Through This, a story of Joseph. And uh, John Maxwell has a, well, Max Lucado, not John Maxwell, Max Lucado, one of the Maxes, uh, has a book on this. If you want to read it, it's a great book. Um, of course, we're just going through the book of Exodus and talking about uh, the story of Joseph. And today we're going to talk about how God restores and so I don't know if you, um, last week I talked about the time of life where you have that heavy duty rake, not the normal rake, but you know that rake that you use when you have to like break through rock or when you lose your other rake, right? <laughs> you use it because you can't find the rake you're supposed to use. And, but you can use that rake to break through rock or to, or to pull up dirt that's a little harder. Maybe, to, to, maybe you got some soil with some weeds. It's those hard times in life. And last week I talked about being faithful in those difficult times. Today we're going to look at this whole idea of restored because after you're faithful in those times, God gives you kind of that next step. Now, I don't know if you're smarter than I am. I'm sure you are. But, but I've done this more than once. I'd love to tell you that I've only done it once, but, but there's been times that I've gone to maybe an Orlando Magic game and brought my binoculars, or maybe I was in the mountains and thought, I want to see across the mountains, and I picked up my binoculars, and I realized I could not see a thing. I, th there was something wrong. I, I was looking, and maybe I tried to adjust them, and maybe it wasn't spun right. Maybe my eyes were not sitting in there right. And so for just a minute, I would struggle with the binoculars and then realize that I had left the lens caps on the binoculars. Anybody in here ever leave the lens caps on the If you're in the parking lot and you've left the lens cap on your binoculars, would you honk your horn? They're delayed by about three seconds. I was just waiting. Well, they're smarter than I am. Either that or they've fallen asleep in their car. But anyway, but we're glad you're here. So, so what happens is sometimes in life, our vision gets clouded. You know, maybe you've been looking through your binoculars. And like me at the Magic Game, you're only four feet tall. And so as you're looking through your binoculars, all of a sudden somebody stands up in front of you. And you realize you cannot see any of the players. And you're thinking, this is really weird. I don't know what's the matter. Or you just get discouraged and you look at the floor. See, the truth is in life, we have choices about where we look. If you're not careful, even when you go through the hard times, you can get discouraged and you can get self-centered and you can get self-focused. Even if you've been a Christian for years and years, it is very easy to allow the selfish gravity of the world to pull you back into only thinking about your own needs and your own self and your own troubles and to get discouraged. Today we're going to look at three steps for God's restoration. As God brings us back. And, and I'm going to get to the ultimate in a second. We're going to talk about uh, remembering our dreams. Do you have dreams for life? Has God put dreams in your heart about who you are and what you should do? If not, I would tell you to encourage you. Pray that God and would give you maybe a new dream for your life. A new vision. Maybe there's another way you want to say it. Maybe just some things that you feel like God wants you to do. Remember that God is the one that brings restitution. We're going to talk about that today. And for those of you who in your mind right now are thinking, I want to get even with so-and-so. And then finally, the final thing we're going to talk about is the idea that God ultimately will bring restoration. Let me tell you this. If you're watching online today, if you're here at home or if you're watching outside, I want you to know that ultimately, if you're a Christian, God is going to restore things to you. It may not be in this life. I'll be honest with you. A lot, of, a lot of the disciples, many of the early Christian fathers, many of the early Jewish folks who were promised dreams from God never saw on this earth their dreams carried to fruition. But God restores and does exactly what he said he'd do. And that's where we're headed today. Bill Pickens and Judy, we're glad you're watching. I cannot say the, the name Guliana. I can say Espinosa. She's watching this morning online, so we're glad she's here. All right. Number one, remembering our dreams brings focus. Because just like these binoculars, all of us can get life out of focus a little bit. We can begin focusing on the wrong thing. By the way, when you focus on the wrong things, it brings frustration, anger, 
irritation. If you're finding that you're irritated and impatient right now, it could not, it may not be a physical problem. It may be that, it may not be that you don't have enough vitamin D. It could just be that you're focused on the wrong thing. In Genesis 42, we're getting closer to the end of the story. It says this. Now, Joseph was the governor of the land, talking about Egypt, the person who sold grain to all its people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. Now, remember, it wasn't quite his dream yet because it was only some of the brothers, not all of the brothers. As soon as Joseph saw his brothers, he recognized them, but he pretended to be a stranger and spoke harshly to them. Where do you come from, he asked. From the land of Canaan, they replied, to buy food. Although Joseph recognized his brothers, they did not recognize him. Now, now think about this. His brothers smell like sheep. His brothers still look the same, probably older, probably even older from being out in the sun every day. They probably looked terrible because we know in just a minute that they were struggling with guilt and shame this whole time. And here Joseph is in front of them, maybe on a gold throne, probably has one of those cool Egyptian headdresses on. He's wearing the fanciest gold woven clothes you could find in the world. He's got a staff, maybe the top of his staff looks like that Journey album because he's got a scarab on top of it, you know, the beetle. You know which Journey album I'm talking about? Oh, come on. It's got Don't Stop Believing on it. How can you forget that? Anyway, all right. So, so all, of, and by the way, the teenagers that are listening just went, Don't Stop Believing. I know that song. It was the senior song of the year two years ago from 1984. Just saying. But anyway, so, so, and then it says this. So Joseph's there. They don't recognize him. Hey, I'm sure he's got makeup on. He's got the whole headdress, the, the whole deal. But he knows his ugly brothers. By the way, ugly stepbrothers. They didn't bring the brother. They only brought the stepbrothers. Then he remembered his dreams about them and said to them, now this had to be fun. You are spies. You've come to see our land is unprotected. No, my Lord, they answered. Your servants have come to buy food. We're the son of one man and your servants. I love this. Your servants are honest men, not spies. Time out. Now you got to realize these are the dudes who are going to be the names for the tribes of Israel. When, when Israelites would read this book of the Bible and would look back at their heritage, they would hear about their ancestry. If they were a tribe of Reuben, they would hear about Reuben and think of sandwiches. If they would, if, if they would hear about Simeon, you know, they would hear what Simeon did. If, if they heard about the other brothers, they would say, oh, look what they did. And let me tell you, one of the things these brothers were never accused of, being honest men. They were not honest men. They had a heritage of dishonesty. Abraham was dishonest. Isaac was dishonest. Jacob, their dad, was dishonest. And guess what? They were all dishonest. Remember, they came in and lied to dad and put goat blood on his thing and said he'd been killed. They were anything but honest men. And I'm sure as Joseph sat there, and dealt with them. He's trying to figure out. Where is my brother? Have you killed him too? Have you changed at all? Or are you still. The evil stepbrothers I remember. And so he begins to challenge them. And The Bible says this in Romans 8.28. And we know that in all things. God works for the good of those who love him. Who've been called a According to his purpose. If you don't hear anything else today. Please take this verse. And put it somewhere in your house. Maybe over your sink. Maybe on your refrigerator if you go there a lot. Maybe in your pantry. Maybe in your car. Because this is a verse that we all need to remember. Especially when times are tough. Notice that this verse does not say, God, everything is good. No, no. It says he can work for the good. So here's the deal. Joseph's brothers intended to harm Joseph. But God used what they did. The evil that they did. He never says that what they did was right. 
God used the evil that they did and worked it for good. That word work for the good here is where we get the word synergy. If you worked at a corporation, they love to use that word to the point that you get sick of it. You're like, if I hear synergy again, I'm going to synergy their head, right? Because, but here's what synergy really means. It's the idea of things becoming more powerful because they're working together. It's when you put several horses on a plow, they can pull much more than each horse individually. It multiplies the power. And that's what it means here. When God gets a hold of your circumstance, when God gets a hold of that person that hurt you, when God gets a hold of that hurt in your life, he can take that very bad thing and work it powerfully for the good. He can use that very thing in your life. And then it says according to his purpose, because here's the deal. It's not just do whatever you want and God will work it out. You've got to be obedient to him. This word refers in the Greek, it's a, it's a reference back to the Old Testament idea of showbread. And I know you've never heard of showbread. It sounds like jazz hands. Okay. But it's the bread that was presented to God in the temple. It was put every week in the temple. There were 12 loaves of bread, little loaves of bread were put in the temple every week. And then every week after they were put in the temple and, and covered with frankincense, by the way, I'm sure they tasted delicious. I don't know what frankincense tastes like, but I'm thinking that's kind of an unusual flavor of bread. Then the bread was taken out and eaten by the priest. At one point, David actually came and asked for that bread. It was taken out and eaten by the priest, and they would replace it with 12 more loaves of bread. By the way, those 12 loaves represent those 12 tribes presented before God. And the Bible says uh, it works for the good of those who love him who've been called according to his purpose. Just like that bread is placed before God. When we place our lives before God, he works things out for the good. The way we might say it in our society is when we surrender what we want, what we desire, what we want to do to God, he works things out for the good. So here's your first challenge. Be faithful and trust God's timing. Boy, that first one is easy, right? Sounds easy until we add the second one. Because God never works in our time. This is over 20 years later. 20 years thinking that all of his brothers hated him and wanted to kill him. And here they are. And here's his chance. But I believe Joseph forgave them long ago. The reason I believe that is because Joseph here had all the power in the world and he could have just dominated and killed all of them. But he had already forgiven because he understood point number two. Restitution is from God. So not only remembering dreams brings focus, but restitution is from God. Harold Brantley, who was my mentor for over 20 years, when I first started pastoring, every once in a while something would happen that was weird. If you haven't been a pastor, you don't know this, but and maybe you do. People can be weird. And somebody who is your friend one day can be your enemy the next. There's actually, in the book of Acts, there's actually a verse where the people were going to worship Paul in one verse. And in the next verse, they dragged him out of the city to stone him to death. It's literally two verses. That's what it's like being a pastor. You are the best pastor we've ever had. We hate your guts. Fire him today. I mean, I've seen that over and over. I've been a pastor long enough. I've seen that happen to fellow pastors. And here's what I know. Harold would call me and say, now, Eric, listen to me. I know it's upsetting. By the way, he's from Texas. I'm doing my best Texas. That's the best. He kind of had this kind of voice. And he'd say, Eric, I want you to know, don't worry about them, fellas. Or don't worry about that lady. God's going to take care of them. You don't worry about it. Let God take care of his deal. You take care of your deal. Joseph knew this. Listen, so, so Joseph's testing them. And here's what he says in verse 20 to 24. And I had to skip around a little bit in here. But you must bring your younger brother to me. Now, why did Joseph want it? He wanted to find out if they'd kill him too. If they hated Joseph, why wouldn't they hate his little brother? They were all the stepbrothers, so maybe they killed him. And then he says, so your words may be verified and you may not die. Now imagine what that was like. By the way, somebody online just said it's hard to wait. Anybody in here relate? Is it hard to wait? Anybody in here love waiting? I just love, right, yeah, you're crazy if you do, right? It, listen, so much of our life we're like a little kid on Christmas waiting for God to fix everything. And we just said, come on, when you fix it, I'll get right. Listen, you obey him today. So it continues. It says, it says, then that you may not die. By the way, I'm sure when he said you may not die, they shook. Because they knew he had all the power. 
This they proceeded to do, and they said to one another, listen to the guilt they've been carrying around. Surely, don't call me Shirley, surely we are being punished because of our brother. Listen to this. We saw, now listen, they're replaying the scene of what they did. We saw how distressed he was when he pleaded for us for his life, but we would not listen. That's why this distress has come on us. Listen, every time these brothers had a struggle, this was the conversation, I bet. Day after day, month after month, year after year, guilt and shame. They were reaping what they had sown by throwing Joseph in the well. They suffered day after day. Listen, that person that hurt you, it is not your job to get even with them. It's not your job to fix them. It's not your job to hold them accountable for what... Listen, you let them go. It doesn't mean you have to be friends with them. It doesn't mean you have to hang around them. But you have to forgive them. Now listen to this. Reuben replied... Didn't I tell you not to sin against the boy? Remember, Reuben tried to save him, but you wouldn't listen. Now we must give an accounting for his blood. So Reuben reminds him, I told you so. Imagine this conversation happened over and over and over again. Now listen to what happens yet next. They did not realize that Joseph could understand them since he was using an interpreter. He turned away from them but, and began to weep. Time out. You know why he began to weep? He thought they all hated him. All these years, Joseph thought that every stepbrother hated him. And he realized, first of all, that they had been suffering for what they did. But second of all, he realized probably, and I'm sure, for the very first time, that Reuben tried to save him. And so he realized all these years he thought Reuben hated him too. He probably was, had at night sometimes probably said, I thought Reuben liked me. This was the moment where after over 20 years, he realized that Reuben tried to save him and that his brothers had been suffering week after week, year after year. But then he came back to him and spoke to him. He had Simon, Simeon, excuse me, taken away from them and bound before their eyes. By the way, exactly what happened to him. This word is exactly the same as how he was bound. And then a few verses later, it said, at the, they, remember, they got their grain, they left. And then it says, at the place where they stopped for the night, one of them opened his sack to feed his donkey and saw the silver in the mouth of his sack and said, my silver's been returned. Here is my sack. And then it says, their hearts sank. They turned to each tr other trembling and said, listen to this, what is God? What is this that God has done to us? All these years, they lived in guilt and shame because of what they had done. Listen. The person that hurt you may never show that guilt and shame. That person that did that horrible thing to you, you may think, well, they really don't care. But let me tell you something about life. You cannot go through life hurting other people and there not be consequences. But it's not your job to bring the consequences. Now, that doesn't mean that if somebody hurt you, you don't need to call the police. It doesn't mean that if you see child abuse, you don't take care of it. It doesn't mean that you don't report somebody who hurt you. I'm not talking about that, but I'm talking about that year after year. You're holding on to something. It may even be somebody who's already passed away. Let God take care of it. Listen to what it says in the New Testament. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, it doesn't always depend on you, by the way. I have people who hate my guts. People, there were people that I didn't know hated my guts that I ran into in a store and found out they hated my guts. That's a lot of fun, by the way, to go up to somebody and go, hey, how you doing? And have them go and walk away. If you've never had that happen, I want you to know that's the funnest part of being a pastor. As far as it depends on you, be at peace with all men. And then it says this, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. Listen, don't do God's job. For it is written, it's mine to avenge, I repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. Which is exactly what Joseph just did, by the way. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you'll heap burning coals on his head. This word for coals is the, literally the word anthrax. Now, it doesn't mean you're going to give somebody anthrax if they... But the idea of coals is the idea that their conscience... They're going to realize that you didn't deserve how they treated you. 
When you return evil for evil, then it's easier for people to say, well, they got what they deserved. But when you return good for evil, it's very hard for people to continue to say, well, I did what I needed to do. And so often God will use that to bring repentance to them. Forgive and let God bring justice. So remembering our dreams being focused, restitution is from God. And then finally, restoration blesses you and others. Listen, there is nothing like having things restored. Years ago, I was given a little thing that sat on the shelf in my grandmother's house. It was a, believe it or not, it was a little toilet. It was, it was my grandfather. They went and got knickknacks everywhere. But this is the one my brother and I remember. It was a little toilet and there was a guy in the toilet. When you opened it, the little guy, my brother and I were little. We'd look at it and laugh. <laughs> and on the side of the toilet, it said, goodbye, cruel world. And my brother and I all remember that. Well, about two years ago, I overheard my brother say, I wonder whatever happened to that. I wish I had that. Well, he didn't know I had it. And then I couldn't find it. But he was at my house this week. And I went into my office. And I got that little toilet. And I gave it to my brother. And he said, I wondered what happened to this. And he opened it and he said, isn't this just like grandpa or something he would do? I said, exactly. We are hillbillies, by the way. That is a hillbilly. Is and to watch his face as something so small. He was given. Imagine when you get to heaven and God restores everything. And imagine that person or that child or that situation you've been praying about. For some of you, that will change and be restored on this earth. That prayer you've been praying, you're going to see God bring it to fruition. You're going to see God restore people. So don't give up. In, chap in chapter 45, I, I did the verses to just try to explain the story. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. And then he says this, is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer him because they were terrified in his presence. You can imagine what that was like. So then, and then he says to his brothers, don't worry. And then he says, so then it was not you who sent me here but God, he made me father to Pharaoh, Lord of his entire house, ruler of all. I'll provide for you there. Because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all belong to you will become destitute. Then he threw his arms around his brother Benjamin and he wept. But it doesn't stop there. And he kissed all his brothers and wept over them. Afterwards, his brothers talked with him. Listen. Listen. All these years, Joseph knew the evil his brothers had done, but he did not focus on the evil. All these years, he knew what his brothers had done was wrong, but he just focused on doing what God wanted him to that day. In the New Testament, that's described very simply this way. In Romans 12, 21, it says, Do not be Overcome by evil. By the way, this word for the first one that says overcome means to be under. So it means don't let evil overwhelm you. You ever look at the world or look at a situation and get overwhelmed? That's what this is talking about. You feel the pressure, the weight of evil. It says don't be overcome by evil. And then it says but overcome. This is a totally different word. It, it's where we get the word Nike. Like the shoes, Nike in the Greek. It, 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 was, it was representing the idea of being a victor, a conqueror, an overcomer. You didn't know you were wearing conqueror shoes when you wore Nikes, did you? And so he's saying, don't be under evil, but get on top of evil with good. So how do you overcome evil? By thinking evil things? No. By focusing on the evil in the world? No. By focusing on everything that was done wrong to you? No. By doing what's right. You can't help what other people think about you. You can't help what other people have done sometimes to you. But you can do what God wants you to do today. So what does he want you to do? 
This morning I reached out to one of my black pastor friends and said to him, is there anything we can do? Is there any way we can help you? Is there any way we can show you love as a community, as a church? Because in our world that right now is full of hate and evil, as believers, we should be the ones saying, I understand that the whole world is crazy, but we never overcome hate with hate. Only love can overcome it. I can't fix what's happening around the country, but I can call my friend and I can say, how can I help? And you can call your friend and you can call your family member and you can forgive that person that doesn't deserve to be forgiven. And you can say, God, what do you want me to do? Don't be overcome by evil, but overcome evil by just doing what's good. Remembering our dreams being, bring focus. Remember that restoration, restitution is from God, but restoration will come. If you're a follower of Christ, as you follow him, he will give you victory. And finally today, I want you to know God restores the faithful. So your job is just to be faithful. Just do what God's called you to do today. Love the people God's put in your life. Care about them. Don't get so caught up in all the things out here that you're just overcome. You're exhausted just thinking about all the evil in the world. Instead, God, help me to just do what's good through your spirit, through your power. If you're watching online or if you're here today and you're not a Christian today, you can give your life to Christ. It's simply by saying, just like that bread before the offering, you say, God, I surrender my life to you. I know that Jesus died on a cross and rose again. And like John 3, 16 says, he loved us so much that he died for my sins. So that if I believe, if I put my faith in him, if I surrender to him is another way to say it. The Bible says I'll have eternal life. He will restore all things and better than we've ever had. By the way, heaven's better than anything you could ever have on earth anyway. So if you're here today, if you're watching online, you want to become a Christian, you can see me after the service or you can text me, email me, Facebook note me, whichever way you want to contact me. I also want to tell you today, Christian, we're in a world that will always try to pull you away from this realization that God's going to restore things. Just be faithful in the moments. If you haven't been, just confess that to God and make it right. If there's somebody you need to forgive, hey, you may need to say to God, God, I don't feel like forgiving so-and-so. Would you help me feel like feeling like forgiving them? By the way, I've been that far from forgiveness before where I've had to say, God, would you help me to feel like forgiving like I want to forgive? Because I don't even want to want to forgive. And he can change your heart and my heart and help you to be an overcomer. Let's pray. Father, thank you for these moments. Thank you for these folks who are the, recognizing the seniors today. We pray that you would especially bless them. Lord, I thank you too. For each one that's here, each one that's watching online, each one that's listening in the parking lot and listening outside. I pray, Father, that today you would help us all to overcome evil with good. To be the light. To be salt in a world that needs spice. To be love in a world that looks for hate. Lord, that we could be light to other people in love. Help us to overcome by your power, by your spirit. Thank you for these moments in Jesus' name. Amen. We have a